Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to worship this day. We'll invite everybody into the sanctuary. I invite us to come. Let the warmth and grace and peace of the Holy Spirit bind us together as we worship this morning. morning, will you please stand and join me in the call to worship. We gather to worship God, who creates us and loves us, who gifts us with diversity and makes us for community, who gives Jesus Christ to show us how to live, who inspires children, youth, young adults, and people of all ages, to seek justice, share power, and live together in love and equality. Who invites us to join the struggle for wholeness and well-being for all. And whose presence, grace, and love sustains us in our living. We gather to worship God. To God be all glory, honor, and praise. Our opening hymn is number 139, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, found in your hymnal and also on the screen. Thank you. 
in the opening prayer. Generous God, we praise you for all your gifts to us, for the gift of courageous people whose knowledge of you has helped them change the world. Particularly, we thank you for those servants like Martin Luther King Jr. and others whose prophetic witness has challenged and moved us closer to your kingdom. We give thanks for the opportunity to come together as your people and to worship you. Help us in this time to hear your word and be not afraid to stand up and live out our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite our uh, young disciples up. Come on up. All right. Good morning. Good morning. So, so today we're going to look at some, some common objects. I'm going to use the screen to help us a little bit. So you see what I'm wearing, right? What am I wearing? Fitbit. A Fitbit. Boy, I wish. <laughs> no, I'm wearing just a watch. <laughs> but if it looks like a Fitbit, whoo, I'm good. <laughs> no, it's just a watch. It's just a watch. But do you ever wonder what it looks like inside, though? So look at this picture. That's a digital. That's a, that's, a little, that's a watch. It's the inner workings of it. How about this? How about this? That's a phone. Yeah, what do you think the inside looks like? But you know what? It's, it's pretty complicated, isn't it? But it's also pretty beautiful, isn't it, when you look at how all that stuff is put together. This is the inside of a phone like this. Look at all the little gear. And sir, <laughs> she goes, ew. <laughs> but it's pretty complicated, isn't it? Right? I mean, did you know that's all in here? No, yeah. You know, we have a scripture that we're going to hear in total, but this is a piece of it. It says, you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We are wonderfully made on the inside of us. We're much more complicated than phones and watches, and we made phones and watches, but who made us? God made us, yeah, for which we are so thankful. But because we are so wonderfully made, it means we are so beautiful and we are so precious. Today we celebrate someone's birthday, Martin Luther King Jr. Today is his birthday. And he stood for what this psalm stands for, which is he said that we look at people not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, right? So it's nothing to do with the outside because on the inside we are beautiful. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. So I want you guys to remember just how precious you are, just how beautiful you are to God, and it doesn't matter about anything on our outsides because our insides are what God has given to us. And just as we have watches and, and phones and all that, and they can look pretty on the inside, we are even more beautiful as that. What's inside the remote? What's inside the remote? <laughs> well, we're not going to start disassembling things, but I'm sure it's just as beautiful. <laughs> I'm not going to show you now because I actually need it. So maybe later. <laughs> Let's say a prayer. Oh, God, we thank you for how you have created us and made us so wonderful, so beautiful as your precious children. I thank you for these young disciples, for these beautiful disciples that are here. And uh, I pray for them and for us to always see what is inside others and when they meet others to see how beautiful they are for you have created each and every one of us and given us this wondrous, beautiful world. Be with them and watch over them and uh, be with them as they go to Sunday school, continue to learn more and more about you. Amen. All right. You guys can go to Sunday school. Everybody else can stand. Let's share the peace of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 18. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. 
You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful, too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days adorned for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Our gospel this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Luke. It is uh, there in your bulletin, and I invite you to stand for the reading of our gospel lesson. Hear these words from Luke's gospel. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the, sc and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May God add a blessing to our hearing and living out of the word this day. You may be seated. I come to the end, but I am still with you. These are the words that we heard of David in the psalm but they could express the emotion and commitment of Martin Luther King Jr. as well. The end nearly came sooner than later. The year is 1968. The place is Memphis, Tennessee. Elvis Presley is living in Graceland with his wife Priscilla and his newborn daughter, Lisa Marie. He's enjoying the Grammy. He's just won for a second gospel album, How Great Thou Art. In many people's minds, he is the king. But in the March of that year, another king came to town, came to Memphis. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. traveled to Memphis to lead a march in support of the city sanitation workers. These 1,300 workers, most of whom were black, have been on strike for safer working conditions, higher wages, and equal treatment under the law. Unfortunately, several militant groups turn the march violent, and King announces over a bullhorn to the crowd, I will never lead a violent march, so call it off. He promises to come back to Memphis in early April to lead a march that is, and only is, nonviolent. King returned on April 3, 1968. Several death threats had been directed at him. Tension is high, but he feels it's important to press ahead and speak at the rally on behalf of these sanitation workers. In the course of his address, which turns out to be his last speech he'll ever give, he tells the story of an earlier attempt on his life, one that brought him perilously close to death. So according to Raph Abernathy, his friend and successor, Martin Luther stood up that night and he just preached out his fear. This is what Martin Luther King said. He said, you know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. And while I was sitting there autographing books, a demented black woman came up, and the only question I heard from her was, are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down writing, and I said, yes. And the next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon, and that blade had gone through, and the x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. 
And once that punctured, you drown in your own blood, and that is the end of you. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had sneezed, I would have died. Sometime after the operation, after my chest had been opened and the blade taken out, they allowed me to move around and to read the mail that had come in from all over the states and the world. Kind letters had come in. I read a few, but one I will never forget. I'd received telegrams from the president and vice president, but I'd forgotten what those messages said. I received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I forgot what was said. But there was another letter that came from a young girl at White Plains High School, and I looked at that letter, and I'll never forget what it said. It said simply this. Dear Dr. King, I'm a ninth grader at White Plains High School. While it should not matter, I would like to mention that I am a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering, and I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing to you to say I am so happy you didn't sneeze. And I want to say tonight, I want to say to you that I too am happy I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when all the students across the start, South started sitting at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best of the American dream. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been here in 1963 when the black people of Birmingham, Alabama aroused the conscience of the nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that year to tell America about a dream that I had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis tonight to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy I didn't sneeze. I'm so happy I didn't sneeze, proclaimed Martin Luther King that night. If he had not remained very still, very calm, very peaceful during that attempt on his life, he would, he would not have been able to put together one of the greatest movements for justice and equality that our nation has ever known. Not that Ting, King took any personal credit for his survival. He gave all the glory to God. After this attempt on his life, he said, if I demonstrated unusual calm during the attempt on my life, it was certainly not due to any extraordinary powers that I possess. Rather, it was due to the power of God working through me. Throughout this struggle for racial justice, I have constantly asked God to remove all bitterness from my heart and to give me the strength and courage to face any disaster that comes my way. This constant prayer life and feeling of dependence on God has given me the feeling that I have a divine companionship in the struggle. I know no other way to explain it. It is the fact that in the midst of external tension, God can give an inner peace. In the course of his life, Martin Luther King walked through many dangers, toils, and snares, but because of his deep, abiding, constant prayer life, he knew that God was walking with them. He knew that the God who, in the words of the psalmist, formed his inward parts and knit him together and declared that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made, walked with him every step in this life. He had the very same faith as the writer of Psalm 139 who proclaimed, you hem me in behind and before me and lay your hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. In other words, life may be fragile, and life may be full of struggle and hurts and griefs and difficulties, but we draw comfort from the knowledge that God is with us in all that we do. In the midst of external tensions, it is God who gives us peace. This peace gives us courage and confidence and inspiration and insight and serenity and strength. Most of all, this peace frees us to live out God's mission and love to our world. This is important because peace doesn't necessarily protect us from any pain and any suffering. But it does give us strength to face any fear, to comfort the journey through the valley of the shadow of death, and to have a faith to take bold stands for justice. And so the peace that we feel, the peace that the psalmist declares, the peace that Martin Luther King said allowed him to remain still as a knife blade was plunged into his body, this peace 
does not paralyze us. It does not make us feel complacent, but it moves us forward and outward with an even greater urgency to live out our faith. For that's what Jesus proclaimed in his hometown synagogue when he stood up and was handed the scroll of Isaiah and he read these words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and bring recovery of the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. We are called as individuals and more so as the body of Christ to go deep, deeper than you ever have before into our prayer life and our faith life so that we have this foundation of faith where we are strengthened and emboldened to live out these words as we proclaim the good news, as we heal the brokenhearted, as we bring freedom, as we announce a new vision of hope and new life to all, not just to some, but to all. We're to take a stand and show that in the midst of our brokenness, our hurts and our struggles, that there is a hope and there is a peace that passes all understanding. In the midst of our violent, warring world that contains too much oppression, too much intolerance, too much inequality, and poverty, we stand up and we declare with our faith, there is hope. For families and individuals who are struggling with addiction and mental illnesses, there is hope. For those who have lost a loved one, for no one can lose a mother or a father or a sister or a brother or a child without yearning for hope. And Sunday after Sunday, week after week, we come together, we gather together in the presence of our risen Savior, striving and yearning for these words of good news, of hope. And we need to know and proclaim that God is not done yet, that failure is a fact of life, but God isn't done yet, that grief is a fact of life, but God isn't done yet, that hurt is a fact of life, but God is not done yet. Martin Luther King stood up and showed us that when a people of faith and when communities of faith stand up and stand together, that is when justice will roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's when hearts and minds are touched and transformed by the grace and the hope and, yes, the peace our world so desperately needs the peace of Christ. So let us not fear to stand up from our stronghold of peace, our foundation of peace, given to us by our God as we stand with those in need of justice. Reach out for peace. Shout out for righteousness. Let us be light bearers for all our children who need to have that moral guidance and stability in their lives. Grace bearers for people that are so often overlooked. Hope bearers for people who are discriminated by race, excluded because of income, bullied or beaten. Peace bears to a world broken and divided by the need people have to be right, more than the need to show justice and grace and reconciliation and forgiveness. Let us carry these things to our world and all the other shallow things of life will not matter. When we leave this world, when we breathe our last, we won't take any money, we won't take any possessions, we won't take any of the fine things with us. All we leave behind is the character of our committed faithful life, because it is the quality, not the longevity of one's life that is important. With that, I invite you to watch this.
The next day, after that rally, an assassin's bullet ended Reverend King's life. But we come and we know that he faced that moment with peace in his heart because he knew, because he preached, because he lived it out that God was right by his side. Being a disciple of Christ does not free us from any toils or troubles or struggles, struggles and snares or stumbles and sneezes. On the road of life, we are bound to hit potholes. But we come today to proclaim what good news that we are not alone. And through our foundation of our prayer and our faith life, we have access to the presence and the power and the peace of our loving God who holds us up and moves us forward on our path. We know, like Martin Luther King, that we're never going to be free from adversity. But we are always free to serve God in every time and in every place and in every situation. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing. We need a faith from our faith we sing hymnal, hymn 2181. you to lift up the joys that you have to praise God for, the concerns that you have. Our ushers will have microphones so we can hear one another and those that uh, may be listening to this on our recording can hear you. So what are your prayers this morning, joy or concern? And also, choir. Oh. Well, I have a joy and that joy is that today is not only Martin Luther King's birthday, but it is Elspeth Rosa Mendel's birthday. And she's a dear friend of ours. So it's a Lithuanian real birthday, but, but she also was born to us in the United States when she came many years ago, and so we are glad to share her with you, and we rejoice in her presence. All right. Happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Others? I would ask for your prayers for a, a friend and former co-worker who's Gravely ill. His name is Bill. All right, poor Bill. Sure. Well, first of all, it was good to see you and the family at the uh, the Domes Christmas Eve party. Yeah, the Christmas <laughs> Eve. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've been traveling a lot. Uh, as I mentioned, maybe a month ago, my my cousin, my second cousin, um, his mother was my is my first cousin, and his grandmother is my aunt. <laughs> 
kind of complicated, but you know my family structure, so it's not difficult to understand. I just got back from Texas, from Dallas, Texas, from, uh, from his funeral. He, uh, he died two days before my birthday. My birthday was the 30th of December. And uh, it was wonderful to hear a um, great young man, he was a federal, federal judge, uh, age of 38, the youngest they've ever had, uh, hear people talk about him in the, the way I knew him too. And it's always a comfort when you go to an event of death or celebrating life, rather, to hear everyone being very consistent about who the person that they knew was. And so I stand here today telling you I, I'm happy, very joyous, because his spirit has been released now. And as we all know, to make this very short, uh, the physical that we live in now, there's a time limit on it. So don't ever forget that. And also, the spiritual is eternal. Don't forget that also. Thank you, John. <laughs> other prayers this morning? Other joys that you have with your heart? Concerns? Yeah, please. Um, I have a quick joy. Um, I don't know how many people know Philip's background, but he's been avidly trying to um, figure out a way to march in a drum corps uh, this whole next summer. And I bet Ellen doesn't know this. I just got a text about five minutes ago. He was just offered a contract in Oregon. <laughs> All right. Congratulations to Philip. Philip's going to be traveling. <laughs> Other uh, prayers? Other joys? Yeah, Penny. Um, I have a hard time here, but I think I'll try. But, um, um, my college roommate found us today after a very long battle of breast cancer. And she um, heard the prayers that Owen had over her little boy's 11th birthday. Mm -hmm. And on Saturday, she asked for prayers for that. So prayers of comfort for a very good friend of Penny's who died from a, her long battle with breast cancer on the same day as her son's 11th birthday. So we pray for that family in the midst of their brokenness and grief. Others? Yeah, Ellen. And prayers for my cousin who's also struggling with breast cancer who yesterday flew from Florida to her <coughs> family's home in New York and they're deciding see if there's any other treatment she can do once it's advanced. Wow. Yeah. So prayers for those struggling with, with breast cancer. Now, yeah. yeah. Um, prayers for my uh, friend Kelly, whose 20-year-old son has um, been in like a sedation uh, coma for two weeks for his lungs. Uh, he doesn't have a fungal infection that is turning to a, a respiratory syndrome Prayers for Kelly and, uh, and her family this day. Other uh, prayers, any joys or other concerns? Ginger. I have some rambling thoughts going through my head this morning, and I beg your indulgence. Um, there's an article in this spire, the current spire, about thanking people for all the things they do for this church. It's pretty general. But I'm thinking here, as I walked in this morning, this is kind of my rambling thoughts. I felt a peace here, and I thought about all the people who put away all of the Christmas decorations. There were boxes and boxes that had to be packed up and put away. Um, the tree, the wreaths, the candles, the garlands. And the odd thing is, I love the Christmas decorations, for the festive and the spiritual meaning. But I have to admit that I love when they're put away. I love, maybe it's the OCD in me, I love the peace, the simplicity, the uncluttered of this sanctuary. And in all of the, the deep things that we're hearing to pray for today, maybe there's some things in this packing up and putting away 
that we ought to get rid of. Maybe there's some things in our house or in our workplace that we ought to pack up and put away. Maybe we ought to pack up and put away anger and regrets, procrastination, indecisions. And so if some of that is with any of you, as some of it is with me, it's time to pray. I'll pray for you. No, I'll pray with you. We'll pray together that we can put away the things that are getting in the way of the hope and the joy that we need to have. And I apologize if this is a bit heavy. And as, as with me and as I'm sure somebody's waiting, there is a lighter end. And my lighter end is today there is something we can pack up and put away, and that would be cowboys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other joys. <laughs> Other concerns. <laughs> Other prayers of your hearts that you may have this day. All right, well, with all these prayers that you've named and those in our hearts, let's pause. Let us be in prayer. Oh God, this morning we gather from the midst of our world and our lives, from the midst of the struggles. We lift to you these prayers of concerns for those who are grieving deep, heavy losses and are in deep sadness for those who are struggling with cancer and other illnesses and injuries. For our world, O oh Lord, broken, divided in many ways. For the injustice, for the wars that are going on, for the places where there are and there is no peace. O oh Lord, we come this morning to lift to you all these prayers, knowing that you have knit us together that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you have created us and given to us this world, not to abandon us, but to be even closer to us through Jesus Christ. So, O oh Lord, that is our hope. That is the source of our peace, the peace that does not paralyze, but moves us forward and outward. O oh Lord, this day we do lift up these prayers of concern for friends, neighbors, loved ones, for those we know and those we don't, those close to the building of this church, those in the neighborhoods around us, the cities around us, and the world around us. To lift them up to prayers and to your presence of comfort and of hope and yes, of peace that is with us. For your healing presence to be with those who need it this day. Oh Lord, we come. We come into this moment to be filled with your peace. Not to sit still, but that peace that moves us on, that gives us the strength, that gives us the hope that we need. For, O oh Lord, we gather in this time and this place also in the midst of great joy. The joy of friends and family that journey with us, the joy of those who pray with us and for us, the joy of our church family that is with us, the joys of the celebrations of life, and the achievements of life that we attain. But most of all, the joy of your Son, Jesus Christ, who does know our hurts and our griefs and our struggles and does not abandon us but walks with us and walked with us all the way to the cross and beyond to an empty tomb to show us that there is always hope. Oh Lord, we come and lift to you these joys and these concerns and these prayers that we've named, but there are others on our hearts, and so we take a moment just to pause, to listen, to let your Holy Spirit move through and touch us in this time of silent prayer.
O oh, gracious God, as you've heard our prayers, both silent and spoken, hear us as we, this community of faith, joins together in prayer this morning. As we pray, our Father, announcements this morning as we live out our faith. First of all, our choir knows this. You got to stay. <laughs> We're going to rehearse right after worship. Our Expedition Norway, our um, children's program is continuing tonight at four o'clock here at the church. There's also dinner for everybody. So anybody who wants to come for dinner, we'll be serving that at 5.30 today. Our women's choir has been moved, so they were going to meet at six. They are now meeting at seven, so they're meeting a little bit later tonight. Our lunch bunch on history and prophecy of the Bible is continuing at 11 with our lunch at noon. And Tai Chi also is continuing Mondays and Fridays, which you are invited to come be a part of. Also, remember to turn in your pledge cards. There's extras in the back as we continue to put our, uh, support our ministries in, in this new year of 2017. Also, the flower chart. Continue to sign up on the flower chart. We um, thank the flowers given today in honor of Ben and Ellie's 17th birthday. That's a great joy. So that's from the Huffman family, the flowers on the altar. So if you'd like to recognize, honor, have a special event, or you just want to help beautify our sanctuary, sign up on the flower chart outside the church office across from the elevator. Um, we have a CPR friends and family course sponsored by our parish nurse team that's coming up on Saturday, January 28th. Um, and you got to contact Susan. Her contact info is in the insert. So I invite you to um, take this class. This class will save a person's life. We hope to never use it, but if you do, It'll save a life. Also, on Sunday, January 29th, is our drive-in movie at 4.30. We're going to be watching the film Frozen, and everybody's invited. So it doesn't matter your age. You're all invited to come. We're going to eat, and we're going to um, watch this uh, great and, and wonderful movie. So um, also our outreach dinner auction continuing on. So get your reservations in. If you have things for the auction, great. We still need support. Lou, what announcements do we have today? All right. Anything else? The auction? Yeah. The three said four thirty on the drive in movie. Right. Uh four thirty would be it. <laughs> Let's go with four thirty. That's what was in the spire. That the article that was actually written by Peg. So um, I'm gonna go with Peg <laughs> on that. So all right. Anything else? Yeah, Irene. All right. And we, and we have a meal site the last Thursday of this month, the 26th of this month. The sign-up sheet is at the bottom of the stairs. So sign up to come out and um, help at the meal site as well. Did I miss anything else? Otherwise, I invite you to read through the insert for other announcements. Um, as we come to take our offering, this is one of our special Sundays that we celebrate. Um, one of our special Sundays that we do through the United Methodist Church. Today's is called Human Relations Day. And it's very simple. This day always falls on the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. because this offering, 100% of it, goes to continue the work that Martin Luther King began. You have an envelope in your bulletin that looks like this, and you'll see on the front it says, provides acceptance and love to people whom society often reject. So any, and this is an option, don't have to, but if you would like to give towards this, this money will go to continue the work and the ministry of the Dr. Martin, of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. With that, I invite us to come to give our hearts and our souls and everything that we are and have to God as we come with open hands to give back to God. I'll invite our ushers forward to collect this morning's offering and our choir for our next gift of music.
Let us pray. O Lord, for this time and for this way we have to give back to you, to give of ourselves and to give of these gifts, we give thanks and praise to you. We pray your blessing on all these gifts as we continue to live out the mission and the ministry, to continue to spread hope and grace and peace to this world in your name. Amen. Let's join in our closing hymn from our worship and song hymnal, I Have a Dream, 3127. And so may that peace and may that hope and may that grace and may that love unite us and send us forward to extend it beyond the walls of this church. As we sing to close our service, go in the peace of God. Mm -hmm.